want to welcome you, family. You know, it's, it's, it's always a thrill. You think you get used to doing this. We must have done 2,000 of these programs. And yet, everyone is new. And, and that kind of reminds me of God. You know, we look at each other, we look at the world, you look at St. Peter's Square on a feast day, all you see is heads, thousands and thousands of heads. And you, you go in New York and you go to the airport and you watch all these thousands of people passing by. You kind of get the impression that you're kind of a tiny grain of sand on the seashore. And so, well, God looks down on everybody and he says, oh, well, okay, I'll take care of all of you. And that's the, the general concept of our relationship with God, very general. But you see, the truth of it is that it's not that way. And, and, and what a misfortune if we live that way, never knowing that my relationship with Jesus is so personal and so private that it's like no one else ever existed. How do you like that? Do you ever want a friend like that? Huh? Do you ever want a desire, a friend that you could say anything to, ask anything of, and share anything with, and know that that person, even if they knew your faults, your weaknesses, your imperfections, would love you with an intense love? Do you have a friend like that? I bet you don't. I hope you do. But you should have a friend like that because he is. Jesus is that kind of friend. Most of us want to reshape everybody and then we'll love them. I would love so-and-so if they weren't so obnoxious, if they didn't have a hot temper, if they weren't jealous, if they weren't sensitive. And so we have all these ifs, and as a result, there are very few people we love totally and purely for themselves. But Jesus does that. See, he loves you as you are, and he wants that personal love from you. He wants to be the main love in your life. That's the first commandment. And then he wants that very love to go out and touch, literally touch your neighbor. He wants in you, wants to go out and touch your neighbor. So that when you touch anyone, they feel the hand of God. That's our commission from God. I commission you to go out and preach the good news. But we know actions are a thousand words, huh? A thousand words. And so the Lord wants us to be Jesus. The Father has destined all of us to be his son on earth. So if I touch you, I touch Jesus. And know the wonderful thing about television, huh? See, I'm here talking just to you in your living room, just to you. If you're alone in your room, I'm talking just to you. If you're with your family tonight, I'm talking just to you. It's a one-to-one -one basis. And I may be talking to 30 million people tonight, but I'm only talking to you. It's such a tiny, tiny, small example of how God works. And, and what a shame it'll be if we have to reach eternity before we realize that the one I loved and wanted to love and wished loved me, I always possess and never knew it. Very much like the innkeepers when Mary and Joseph were looking for a place in the end, do you imagine what those innkeepers would have done if they would have said, this is the promised Messiah, this is the, the, the mother of the promised Messiah, and she's about to bear that promised Messiah tonight? Ah, oh, they not only would have opened their doors, they would have closed the walls with silk. Oh, but he came in. He came in disguise. He came in faith. And he was born in the stable of one of the innkeepers. Nobody knew but a few shepherds and Joseph and Mary. What a shame to come into his own and his own did not receive him or even know 
or care. So don't let that happen to your soul. Don't let that happen because you have all of heaven right here. Desire him, love him, and do his will. That's the whole essence of holiness. We have a wonderful guest this evening. And although I do want to make a big pitch and say, please, put us between your guests and let your book build a season, I want to do all of that. I'm not going to do that because I know you know I need it. And I don't want to spend any more time. I have to. We have a great guest. I'm going to be back with him in just a minute. Tonight our guest is Brother Anthony Opiso from Our Lady of Calvary Trappist Abbey in Canada. Brother was a formerly a physician and then a, a medical missionary before he became a hermit. So please welcome Brother Opiso. My sisters and I had the pleasure of uh, having Brother uh, give him a talk this, this morning's lesson. And uh, I was just uh, absolutely uh, taken with his deep spirituality and love for Jesus. And that's really the only thing that matters, isn't it? Anyway, he's written a book called The Revelation of Bethlehem. And, and it's a very delightful book, but besides, it has something here that's so wonderful. It says, the revelation of Bethlehem by two hermits, one who prayed for, one who wrote. What a combination that is. Brother, what do you try to say in this book? I try to say why he was, why he chose to be born in the little town called Bethlehem. And the little town means the house of bread. And so, in that little book, before he talks about Bethlehem as Bethlehem, it talks about why it was before called Ephrata, which means the fruitful one. Mm -hmm. And then it became changed to the house of bread. And it also uh, tries to explain why he was uh, born in a stable, why he was put in a manger, and why he was wrapped in swaddling clothes, and why he had to suffer and why he had to be first uh, rejected and finally accepted. Well, tell us a little bit about the, the prophecies and, and kind of build up uh, to the birth of Jesus. Uh, the, all the Jewish tradition uh, mentions the fact that the Messiah will be coming from the tribe of Judah and that he is to be born in this little town that was an insignificant little town among all the towns of Judah. But it was really very, very important because from it would come forth the one who was from the ancient and very, very uh, past times. And so uh, it was wonderful that he did then come to us and be born in a house in the town of a house of bread but he was born in a stable and he was put in a manger and so what's the significance of that the, see that, that is very very beautiful why he did that we all know that in the end he gave himself you know his body and blood as bread and wine see and so if he was going to be in the end giving himself to us as bread, uh, it was very beautiful that he started out on this earth where all bread making starts out wow. in the grain bin. Yes. And so that is the meaning of why it is a sign, a sign I give you. You will find a, a child wrapped up in swaddling clothes laid in a manger. And the important thing about that child being wrapped up in swaddling clothes. In the book of Revelation, Jesus speaks and tells us 
that he is the beginning and the end. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the Almighty. And so we all know that when a little calf is born, the little calf can get up and start nursing. Same thing a puppy, same thing for a squirrel, same thing even for a monkey. But the most powerful and yet the most helpless thing in this universe is a human child. Because once a human child has been born, if you do not pick up that child and, and feed it, it will just be there. It will just absolutely, uh, in its helplessness, die. Yeah. And so even more so, he gave us a beautiful sign in that he, the Almighty, came down on this earth utterly helpless. But even more so when he was wrapped up in swaddling clothes mm. because mm -hmm. he was then completely bound. And so you can see the wisdom of God in that. Supposing you had two huge armies opposing armies and you wanted to stop them from fighting each other. You could probably clobber both of them, you know, if you were God, or you could come down in their midst, see, as a little tiny baby. And that is exactly what he did. He disarmed us by arousing our compassion and loving kindness in that child of God, that baby, that son of God. But well, tell us, uh, tell us how that led up to to. Uh, uh, there's always a question in everybody's mind about the wise men and about the shepherds. Why, why, why did God call shepherds? See, the word in Hebrew for shepherds means roim, which is also related to the word to see. See, and so you would say, well, why did God choose shepherds for the you know? because they, they didn't have a very good reputation, as you brought out yeah. one time, Mother <laughs> Angelica. And so the f fact is very, very important, is that at that particular night, they were the only ones who were watching. They were watching over their flock. And so it was very beautiful for him, who is the shepherd of Israel, mm. to manifest himself two humble, simple shepherds who were watching in the night. And uh, not only that, but it is to the very simple that God reveals himself and also to the very wise, the truly wise. That is why the two people that really saw the Lord and, and the Lord revealed himself to at the very beginning were the simple and the wise. Those that had their eyes in loving care of their flocks on this earth and those that had their eyes on the heavens. Praise the God. wise man who saw his star. Why, why the tribe of Judah? I never could uh, figure that out. Well, it's a unique tribe. First of all, you know, he promised Abraham that out of Abraham's line would uh, and sue the kings of Israel. And so when Jacob had his 12 kids, you would think, well, Reuben would be the one because he was the eldest. But then because of what happened, which is covered in the book, um, Reuben lost his birthright. And so did Levi and Simeon, Simeon and Levi. They lost the right to have the Messiah born from them because of what happened to, in, uh, in a place near where our Lord appeared to the, Syro to the um, um, Samaritan woman. Mm -hmm. And so the next in line was the tribe of Judah. And so there's also a hidden reason why. When the, both wives of Jacob were having their kids, all the kids were named uh, with them, 
because of their thing that was going on, you know. See a son, um, Reuben, uh, the Lord will hear me, said Leah, uh, on the second son, which is Simeon. And now the Lord will join to me because I've given him three boys now, Levi, which means join. And the only uh, tribe that uh, was really named in honor of the Lord was Judah. And she, she sort of gave up because her husband still kept being very attracted to the other wife. Mm -hmm. And so she said, this time when he was born, I'll praise the Lord. So Judah means praising the Lord. Praise God. And so not only that, but of all the tribes, that is a tribe that has more uh, Gentile blood in it from marriage uh, marriages to the Gentiles than any other tribe. The very word Judah in the Hebrew tradition means one who has married a Gentile. See? Wow. And so in the blood of Jesus, therefore, uh, was flowing not only Jewish blood, but the tribe of, I mean, the blood of everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is fantastic. What, what about the city of David? The city of David is, is Bethlehem. Now, what is unique about Bethlehem is that it is a city of kings. See? So we say, well, all I know is that it was a city of David. Yeah. Uh, well, we mustn't forget that Reuben, first of all, Reuben lost his birthright when he went with his father's concubine just in the area of Bethlehem, a mile south of Bethlehem, at the very borders of Bethlehem, in uh, Eder, in the Tower of Eder area. And so that's there where, where Reuben lost his right to kingship. And so, but also right at the northern border of the town of Bethlehem, is where Benjamin was born, from whom ensued uh, Saul, the first king of Israel. And we all know that also in Bethlehem, David was born. And we especially know that in Bethlehem, the Messiah was born, Yeshua. And so it really is a city of kings. Even though it was a very small city, it had a lot to do with all those who were kings and, it could, and who could have been kings in Israel. Well, you can buy it. This book here is called The Revelation of Bethlehem. And I, I think it's just a great book. I'm going to put the address up on a little later. We're going to be back in just a minute and talk about the revelation of the Son of Man. <laughs> We're back with Brother Anthony, and we've been talking, excuse me, about the birth of Jesus. And uh, more uh, important than ever, the prophecies uh, is who he was. And, and uh, this, this fantastic book of Revelation on the Son of Man talks about this. Brother, this is a very unusual picture. I think we have it somewhere. I'm going to show it to you on the book anyway. But this is an unusual picture. I, explain this picture to us. Well, sister, uh, it's a picture that uh, shows Jesus as he probably was wearing a prayer shawl, the mm -hmm. prayer shawl of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And so he has uh, his purple garment there because he is uh, of the royal family of David. And uh, he has the Star of David because we mustn't forget that Jesus was a Jew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, what are these hands now pulling back? Now, that's very important. In order to be able to see him as he is, we have to unveil him. When we hear in the scriptures, so will it be when the Son of Man is revealed. The actual word for the book of Revelation uh, or revealing is to unveil. unveil. See? And so, you're never going to be able to unveil Jesus unless you have knowledge and understanding. And so the two hands represent uh, the hand of one angel, Gabriel, which is the right hand there, 
uh, because he's the angel who gives us understanding. And we learned that from the book of Daniel. And uh, because uh, Raphael was sent to make a blind man see, mm -hmm. and a woman who was not able to know a man finally be able to know her bridegroom, he's the angel that gives us the gift of knowledge, how mm -hmm. to know. And so these two hands represent the hand of understanding, Gabriel, and the hand of Raphael, knowledge. Well, the, the book of John is, uh, explains, John is the ego, the mystic, and the contemplative. and He explains uh, the divinity of Jesus. Talk a little bit about his gospel and what he says. See, when Jesus came to this earth, uh, only his immediate apostles and disciples knew that he was the Messiah. Like Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And so Jesus was constantly uh, telling them not to tell every, anybody about him, about who he really was. See? And so we know that he was uh, the Messiah. And so when we start to say, well, what about the other part of it, that he is the Son of God? And so for really being able to understand that aspect of it, uh, we have to go back to the scriptures. In the scriptures, only three times does God speak of himself as we. And the first time he says, let us make man in his image and likeness. And in the second time, it says, um, let us get Adam and Eve out of here because he reach out of the fruit of the fruit of tree of life and become like one of us, see, mm -hmm. and live forever. And, and so, and then the third time it says, let us go down and confound their tongue. Mm -hmm. So in a very, the fourth time, there's a fourth time, but it's, but it's in Isaiah and it says, let us reason together, but he's talking yeah. to Isaiah. See? Yeah. And so, in this three things, we see the wisdom of God. Because in the first time that the Lord says us, it's the Father, the Creator. In the second time, the only one that Adam could be like is Jesus. Mm -hmm. See? And the third time, the one who re remove and cause the confusion of languages is the same one who came back in the book of Acts, we read about it, and gave everybody the gift of tongues, restored what he took away. Yeah. See, so That's we even good. see a little, you know, sort of a uh, very mystical, in a very mystical manner, the Trinity. Well, why did uh, our Lord like to call himself Son of Man? What did that mean? See, that is what the book is all about. You know, sister, it's, uh, uh, it really is a, a term that uh, doesn't mean anything to us unless we really know what the term really meant in his time. In his time, in the book of Daniel and all that, it was promised that there would be a very great person coming into the world who would be the Messiah and that this person was referred to as the Son of Man. We see that in the book of Enoch and we see that in the book of Daniel. And so what it really means uh, by saying the Son of Man and the book explains that it's a sort of a circumlocution for the word of he who really understands. So uh, what we get from Jesus, he is, as St. Paul says, the wisdom of God. But as a son, he is understanding incarnate. And so just as he is the word incarnate, he is understanding incarnate. And the book of the relation of the Son of Man is about the understanding of Jesus. Unbelievable. There's a lot of names attributed to our Lord. Yes, what are yes. some of them that you can remember? That I can remember? Yeah. Uh, well, he himself referred to himself as the shepherd, you know, the shepherd. Yeah. And he also uh, referred to um, 
himself as um, in the book of Isaiah as the most abject of men, you know, persons. And so what the book tries to say from the very beginning, it, it lets you know the meaning of man in the fullest sense of the term and son of man, because many times we see the combination of both in the scriptures, man and son of man. This is a, these two books are unbelievable books. One called The Revelation of the Son of Man. Is this in some bookstores? Yes, it, uh, it's published by the same sisters, uh, yes. St. Beats Publications. Well, St. Beats Publications, Petersham, Petersham? Petersham, Petersham uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. If you, the address is on your screen, and you can order this book, and you can order this book from the good sisters there. They're Benedictines. It's a very wonderful community. Now, I'm going to go over and try to take over Father Michael's Bible study, and, and then we'll come back for your phone calls, all of that, in just a minute. <laughs> happened to open up the scriptures and I fell upon something that I thought was very appropriate for today anyway. It's Acts 20th chapter and 28th verse. Acts 20, 28, if you have your Bibles with you. It said, Be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you the overseers to feed the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Now, so often uh, we think, well, that just means priests, religious, whatever. But that means everybody. You are your brother's keeper. And we must oversee. We must guard ourselves he says, I know quite well that when I am gone, fierce wolves will invade you and have no mercy on the flock. You know, the world is full of fierce wolves in sheep's clothing. That's the bad part about it. You hear people, you hear those sometimes that that uh, are called theologians or philosophers or whatever. And, and, and they will say the most outlandish things. They will give you permission for birth control, for uh, illicit sex, for just about anything you can imagine. And they cloak it in Scripture under the guise, well, God understands that's the way he made you. Those are wolves in sheep's clothing. And some of that sheep's wool wearing thin. Because you begin to see fangs after a while and you realize this is not the truth. This is not the truth. This isn't what God is asking of me. This isn't what, it is not what the church is teaching. Your neighbor does that to you sometime. The people in your office. I know a man not too long ago had to quit his job because his boss demanded that he go or have party after party after party after party. And if he didn't drink with everybody and didn't tell dirty jokes with everybody, he wasn't one of the crowd. And so because of that, he said, look, I'm losing my soul in this job. I quit. Now, that happens a lot for the sake of making a living. And I know you have to make a living. But you've got to be careful who you deal with, who you work with, and who you associate with. Some of you teenagers are surrounded by fierce wolves who have one desire, to bring you down into Gehenna with them. So if you haven't had at least one affair, you're not in with the crowd. 
if you haven't taken cocaine or you haven't taken drugs or crack or whatever it is, you're not one of the crowd. So you're all going down this broad road under the guise of being one with everybody. You be one with God. You forget the crowd. That's a fierce wolf. It says fierce. And you can prove it because you're afraid to say no. And once you get in, you can't get out. You're more afraid to get out of a situation than you were afraid of not getting into it. And as a result, you're chewed up. And so St. Paul is warning, even from your own ranks, there will be men coming forward with a travesty of truth, a travesty of truth on their lips to induce disciples to follow them. A smidgen of truth. Watch out half-truths. Every heresy is a half-truth. All this kind of new prayer they have along that, that eliminates God, that's all centered in yourself. That you don't really need God. You can do this thing yourself. You can block out your mind. You can arrive at a state of almost amnesia. You can do it all yourself. You don't need grace. You don't need Jesus. You don't need God. That is a travesty. That is a lie. And you got to watch those things. Those are fierce wolves that cloak themselves under the guise of teaching you how to pray. And all along, they're teaching you how to be involved only within yourself. Now, it says, be on your guard. And I command, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace that has power to build you up and give you the inheritance among all the sanctified. You've been bought by the blood of Jesus. What a price to pay. He didn't just say a prayer to the Father, but he could have. He just didn't come down and walk the earth, but he could have. He just didn't kneel on a mountain and pray to the Father and have all the people around him and say, Father, forgive them. He could have done that. But he chose the hard, narrow road. Born in a stable, worked as a carpenter, hidden for 30 years out of 33. Hated by his own people, shunned by the Gentiles, performed miracles, and they were ungrateful. And finally, died on a cross with that beautiful woman his mother called Mary at his feet, one beloved disciple, and an ex-prostitute, Mary Magdalene, a sinner, the fruit of redemption at the foot of the cross. A repentant thief and a repentant centurion whom we don't often think about with a glorious resurrection that followed and a stupendous Pentecost. None of that would have happened though. And he would have never really proven his love. He would have proven compassion and he would have proven his love for us in a way, but not the way he did it, by coming and living in our midst, by being so vulnerable as a child, by growing and experiencing our weaknesses, but never our sin, by doing all of that. He proved his love in a way that you and I should never question, never doubt, and spend our entire lives giving love for love, pain for pain. Unless we do that, we shall surely be eaten up by fierce wolves because without Jesus covering us, we have no defense. We'll be back with your phone calls 
in just a minute. Thank you. We're back with uh, Brother Anthony, and we have a phone call. Hello? Hello, Mother. What is your question? Um, in Scripture, they refer to Jesus as the bright and morning star. I was wondering if your guest could explain what that means and what the significance is behind that. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for your question. Because um, we read in the epistle of St. Peter that he says, hold on to that word that you don't understand right there in the, as, a, as a little tiny light in a corner of your darkish room. He says, hold on to it. He says, don't give it up. Hold on to it. Don't change it. Hold on to it. Until when? He says, until the morning star rises in your heart to give you understanding. So morning star is also a circumlocution for understanding. When in the Dead Sea Scrolls, he says, to all the sons of the dawn. Oh, yeah. And it means to all those who understand. Isn't that fantastic? Because understanding is of the dawn, uh -huh. of the sunrise area, just like knowledge is of the sunset area. That's why the sun knows its setting. Ah, uh, yeah. But all the, t the tribes that... Uh, that were given understanding, like the tribe of Judah, its place was in the east. And uh, in Jewish tradition, the angel Gabriel, who is the one who gave Daniel, he says, Gabriel, make this man to understand. So it's the angel Gabriel who gave Daniel understanding. He's also the angel of the east. And because understanding is also of the right hand, and it's the angel Gabriel who gives us that gift of understanding. That is why he appeared to Zechariah on the right-hand side of the altar. But all those things are explained in the book, sister. Ah, oh, it's just wonderful. We have another call. Hello? Hi, Mother. What is your question? Uh, my question is, uh, if with, with all the signs about Jesus and uh, being a Jew, being from the tribe of Judah, uh, why is the message of Jesus not accepted more by the Jews? because it is their rejecting him in the beginning that gained the whole Gentile world to him. Otherwise, St. Paul wouldn't have gone to the Gentiles. And so, like it also says, it says, this is just temporary. It says the day will come when the veil will be removed so that they will really see that he is the Messiah. And on that day, if we think we've heard anything, we haven't heard anything at all until we hear the gospel really proclaimed by, let's say, a rabbi who has seen that Jesus is the Messiah because they really, uh, really know the scriptures. And St. Paul says in Romans 1-2, uh, what is the advantage to being a Jew? Romans um, 3, verse 1 and 2. Chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. And what does uh, St. Paul says? First of all, it is to the Jews that the very words of God are entrusted. And so it is they, it's from them that we receive the original revelation because the words of God are entrusted to them, and they're still entrusted to them uh, in what they have. What makes it so hard for the average Jew with all the education now to accept Jesus? What is the hang-up? What um, kind of Messiah do they expect? No, the Messiah that was expected was a conquering Messiah, a Messiah that would, you know, remove the yoke of the oppressors and remove the uh, all the... Uh, the chains of the people. And so he was a liberating Messiah. But uh, the Lord first came to liberate us from our, what binds us inside, from sin. 
because it's no use liberating a country if you haven't removed uh, what all the you know, oppression, all that started the oppression in the heart of the oppressors. So it's by first removing what causes oppression in our hearts that we can then have true peace. Thank you. We have another phone call. Hello? Hello. And what is your question? What is your question? My question is this. I don't know. What does a hermit mean? If it means what I think it does, going away, staying out in the woods somewhere. I see that Brother has a deep insight in the scriptures, but it's easy keeping away from all the problems of everyday life that I have to face with my children every day, my wife. I don't know. Is, uh, what is a hermit, actually? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, what I can say is a very important thing that is open to all of us. There was even a book written, The Hermitage Within. See, Each one of us carries his own little hermitage inside that he can get away and be in. And so it's very important because, you see, to, for man to really be healthy, uh, all human beings have to have food and rest. And so we are body and soul. The soul also needs food and rest. But we know that the food of the soul is the word of God and the truth. But where, how can the soul rest and sleep uh, if the soul never sleeps? Well, this is one thing we have forgotten. The soul of man rests in silence. Never in the history of the world has the world been noisier, even in our music, than today, super decibels. And so, you know, I, I can see that, you know, everybody talks about Mother Teresa going to those poor people in India and everywhere else, and you see how cachectic they are, how starving their features seem to be and are actually very, very thin. But if we could see the soul of our people in our Western civilization, we would look exactly like that because we are not feeding our souls and we are not really taking a little time out to let the soul rest in silence. Be still, which is actually the word be silent, and know that I am God, it says in the scriptures. And that is open to everyone. I remember that even as an intern, I sometimes had to climb up to the roof of the hospital just to get away. See? And anybody in an office knows where to go for a few minutes to be with himself or with herself. And we really do need that. You know, what did uh, Jeremiah says? With desolation is the land made desolate because no one ponders in his heart. So we need pondering, pondering time. Pondering, pondering. We need that so badly. We have another call. Hello? Hello. Hi, what Mother. Is, what is your question? Yes, I have a question for Father. I was wondering, Father, you may or may not know, are there any traditions in the Catholic Church that we bring with us from our Jewish heritage? Oh, yes, very much so. Uh, all our liturgy has the roots in the Jewish heritage. And the very uh, uh, gospel is, you know, rooted in the Old Testament. It's rooted in the Jewishness uh, that Jesus lived as an observant Jew. And so I remember one time how awed I was entering a synagogue because there at the very center of the synagogue was the place where they keep the scrolls and there was a little tabernacle lamp right there like we have see and so i i really i really felt the presence of god there in his word and so when we go to a Catholic church, we see the same thing. We see the tabernacle. But what is in the tabernacle? 
It's Jesus, God, in the form of bread. Because we're told in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4, that the Ark of the Covenant had two compartments. And in one compartment was the law, and in the other compartment was a bowl of manna. And so we're really brothers that are separated, but really belong in the same Ark because they honor the Word, and we honor Jesus in the true bread. Praise God. Well, Abbot, I have <laughs> brother. Brother. We want to thank you. Thank Please you, pray Sister for Brian us, and we will pray I, I am, for Brian. you. Please pray for me. Thank you. And I'll be back with Father Philip in just a minute. Thank you.